Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming first thing, uh, 10 a.m. But uh, what I'm going to talk to you about over the next 25 minutes or so, then open a bit for questions, is uh, first of all about obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, really a trivialized and very misunderstood disorder. And then secondly, about the hope that we have in psilocybin as a potential treatment. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what we know about the potential mechanism by which it works, but also about the study that we are funding under Professor David Nutt at Imperial College that started six months ago, which is a feasibility study to see if we can detect a signal in psilocybin as a potential treatment for OCD. And I'll also touch on a number of other studies that are happening, mainly in the US, but also in Israel. And uh, two people I've spoken to, one guy who's a real hero in this, uh, who is Francisco Marino, who's been studying this for nearly two decades now and did the first study 15 years ago, nearly 20 years ago, at the University of Arizona, but also uh, Benjamin Kilmandy um, from Yale, who's been doing a study. And I'll touch in particular on a paper that he wrote and that was published last December, where he looks at a case study of a patient with OCD who responded particularly well to psilocybin treatments, you know, and it is really quite amazing actually to see the difference that it can make, although it doesn't actually necessarily do this in all patients. So a little bit about myself. Um, I have had OCD for 32 years now, since the age of 17. It started in November 1990 uh, when I was living in France. I was at an international school doing my scientific baccalaureate, a very happy um, young um, adolescent. Uh, I had a good group of friends. I was doing well at work, at uh, school and all that. And I can remember the time when the obsessive thought first entered my mind when I was on the bus going home from school. And it didn't leave my mind. I won't go into it. Uh, anybody who he here who has OCD, who has a friend with OCD, a family member with OCD, will know how shameful some of these thoughts are. But I will give you examples of the kinds of thoughts a bit later. And it stuck in my mind then for four years, every single day, every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month for four years. And eventually it went away, then it morphed into something else and all that. And at the time, I had no idea what was happening to me. I spoke to my parents about it, which was great. They're very supportive, but they didn't know what it was. There was no internet. I went into the Yellow Pages, found myself a psychologist, went to see them, and to be honest, they were utterly useless. Um, they did not diagnose me. They took me through a four-year program of psychoanalysis, which was a complete waste of time, and it took me 12 years before I eventually got a diagnosis of OCD, because my brother lent me a book about it. And this was in 2003, when my second son was just, um, just when my wife was pregnant with my second son, and I got immersed again in this relapse of OCD, and eventually, through some cognitive behavioral therapy, I eventually got support. But my journey, particularly over the past 10 years, has been very difficult. I've often suffered, suffered from crippling suicidal depression linked to the OCD. And I have tried all the different treatments, different SSRIs, citalopram, escitalopram, sertraline, uh, you know, augmentation with antipsychotics, risperidone, aripiprazole, uh, you know, all kinds of things, clomipramine, the whole works, and tried all different forms of uh, CBT. And in the end, what really worked for me is actually eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, you know. And that took a good two years. And over for the past three years, I've been symptom free. But I've been really interested in psychedelics, having dabbled a lot in psychedelics in the early 90s, in the rave scene and all that, and actually ended up having a mixed relationship with them for my OCD. At one point, they actually triggered my OCD, taking some magic mushrooms and all that, which is why I approached this whole thing with a bit of caution, but with a belief that it can really absolutely change things from speaking to people for whom it's had a big impact. So five years ago, well, six years ago, I was going through a very, very difficult time linked to my OCD. And my brother told me, uh, you should really try and get something positive out of this, you know. So 
In parallel, for the past 20 years, I've been working on an ultra-rare genetic disease called alcaptonuria, black bone disease, which affects two of my children, and we've been very successful. Uh, we've raised significant funding, around 20 million pounds, and um, we, you know, launched a patient group, and we've gone through clinical studies, and we've now got an approved drug called nitisinone, which has gone through phase two, phase three, and all the way to approval from the European Medicines Agency. And so my brother said, why don't you use those skills for OCD? Because what we know with OCD is that there is not actually that much research happening. There's a bit more now kind of gathering and stuff. So we set up Orchard Orchard OCD six years ago, particularly with a leading professor called Professor Naomi Feinberg, who's one of the leading lights in all of this. And our first call for proposals we did three years ago, and we got 30 proposals from around the world. It went to our independent scientific advisory board, and the one that was selected was psilocybin by Professor David Nutt, okay? And I was really pleased, because actually this is, I've been speaking to Professor Nutt uh, for at least a year or two about his work, and it was something I really wanted to, um, to, to try out, okay? So how many of you here have got OCD or know somebody with OCD? You know, so quite a few of you, okay? So you will know how much of a forgotten condition it is, you know? Um, when, um, you know, you probably know the charity MQ, they were based in London. And they do a study every five years looking at the state of mental health research. And their last study, which came out a few years ago, showed that on average, you know, funding into mental health is way below what goes into physical health. But right at the bottom of the pile, you know, so you have depression, schizophrenia at the top, then bipolar, then you go down, you have the eating disorders. And right at the bottom, you know, completely at the bottom is OCD, which gets 89 pence per person with OCD per year going into research, 89 pence. Okay, that is nothing. And when you see calls for proposals for mental health from say the MRC or whatever, often they forget OCD, it's not even on there, you know. And I was just speaking to this gentleman here earlier on about uh, Dr. Lynn Drummond, who's one of our scientific advisors, you know, uh, who's been studying OCD for 40 years, and we were doing a video with her on Monday, and we were discussing this. And she says she will even give talks to psychiatrists, master classes, and they will be just like, but we don't think OCD is that serious, you know. So there is this misunderstanding about OCD, you know, and it is a devastating condition. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, so I also run and a support group for OCD where I live in Cambridge. I've been running that for six years, actually, because when I joined it six years ago, they're the ones who really helped me, actually, uh, get very good help for my disorder. And uh, one of my best friends from that group took his own life three years ago in the middle of our crowdfunding campaign for psilocybin, okay? And he was suffering from a, a, a kind of little known form of OCD, which we call false memory OCD, where literally his mind would fabricate false memories of horrific things that he'd never done. And he would then obsess every second of every day for months and years and years and years about had he molested a child? Had he accidentally murdered somebody? Had he done these horrific things? And it's a false memory. It's totally fabricated. And the horrible thing, he would then go home because um, he hadn't worked for like 30 years. Very, very bright person. Uh, you know, Cambridge degree, all that kind of stuff. Very good engineer and stuff. And uh, he hadn't worked for years and he would then go home to his parents for months, you know, and try and recover. Then he'd come back to Cambridge and I'd see him again. And he'd be obsessing about the same thing. So my life might have moved on and all that over those months and stuff. He was still stuck in the same hell. And he tried every single treatment under the sun and eventually he took his own life, you know. And that is a form of OCD, which is actually quite common in people with OCD, you know. But they're so ashamed of it, so ashamed of these false memories that they think, did I do that? Did I not do that? That they don't talk about it. And so in the popular culture, people still think OCD is about lining up your pencils, being a bit organized, maybe checking your lock a couple of times and all that. And they just don't realize that it is absolutely horrific, you know. So that is really, and remembering my friend is one of the things that drives me forward with Orchard. So my day job is really AKU and Alcaptonuria, and then the rest of my time is Orchard, which I do as a volunteer. And also, um, I also set up a few years ago a biotech, actually, uh, which is virtual, uh, where we're trying to develop a glutamate modulator for OCD, which is completely completely separate to this, uh, but we're hoping that, you know, we're, you know, we're in the middle of fundraising phase, which as you probably know, is not easy at the moment. Um, so, psilocybin. So anyway, let me just um, move a bit on into this. So a misunderstood trivialized disorder. 1.5 million people probably have OCD in the UK, all right? So 
When you speak to people, you go on the website, it's anywhere between 1% and 3%. It's actually probably closer to the 3%. So Professor Feinberg was involved in a study recently uh, in Zurich where they found, I think, 3.5% of the population had OCD. And there was a study just last year about, OC, about mental health in Rwanda where they found 3% of the Rwandan population had OCD. So it, it's more or less 2 to 3%. Across the world, you know, whatever ethnic group, whatever social economic group, it's around that dis um, around that level. But the type of disorder really changes, you know. So, for instance, just this morning, I had um, breakfast with someone, and at the table, I was speaking to him, and he had had a religious OCD and came from a very conservative evangelical group, you know. And so, what's amazing with OCD is that it tends to fit uh, the kind of cultural taboos or the cultural. Um, you know, kind of um, issues of the particular time. So, for instance, Dr. Drummond was saying how in the 80s, uh, most of the patients he saw had OCD about HIV, you know. And one of our advisors, uh, David Adam, has written a book, a bestseller called The Man Who Couldn't Stop, which was all about his HIV obsession. Um, in the 90s, it moved more to kind of pedophile OCD because there was a lot of, you know, kind of moral you know, taboo around that and all that. And lately, actually, we've met some people whose OCD is more linked to like climate change, and maybe they're having an impact that will tip the world into climate change and all that. So these are things that seem crazy when you don't have OCD, but when you do have OCD, you just totally get it, you know. And it is known as the doubting disease. It's the what-if disease, okay? Um, so 1.5 million in the UK, one in seven attempt suicide. 16% of people with OCD will attempt suicide, and a lot of them will succeed. So it is potentially a terminal illness. You know, it's a really devastating illness. Um, so, so I yeah, that's right. That's the 89P. And this is a study uh, that we recently did with a group called Costello Medical. They did it entirely pro bono for us. Um, they focused on health economics. And we presented that at a conference a few months ago. And hopefully it'll be published in a paper very soon. The cost of OCD to society and the economy, conservative estimate is £11 billion pounds a year. Okay, And that is based on the prevalence of 1.6%. That's around 15 grand per person. So when you compare that to how much is actually spent on research, 89p. So, you know, as I said, uh, existing treatments, very high doses of SSRI, so sertraline, you'll be on 200 milligrams. It'll take months to have any effects. In 40% of patients, it will have no effect. When it does, it might reduce your symptoms by 30% and all that. Augmentation of antipsychotics and generally exposure response prevention, which again does not work for everybody. So psilocybin. So as I said, um, Dr. Marino did this study in 2006 on nine patients with different doses. And the reason he did that, so I met him in London uh, four years ago, just for the pandemic. And he said the reason he did that, he'd come across many case reports um, on the internet of people who had managed to treat their OCD using magic mushrooms. And he thought there's really something interesting there. So he did it on nine patients. Two of them dropped out. Um, apparently, I was listening to his talk a few days ago, and they dropped out just because it was in a psychiatric environment and they didn't like it, nothing to do with the actual drug. But in the remainder, they did three different doses 100 micrograms, 200 micrograms, and 300 micrograms per kilogram. At 300 micrograms, that's a full-blown psychedelic experience. And they also interspersed that with a, a, a very low dose, which they used a placebo. And fascinatingly enough, at every single dose, they actually found a reduction in symptoms. You know? And they didn't actually find it to be dose-dependent, which is really, really interesting. And they tested at 24 hours, and then they came back, and they also saw a marked de decrease over time. Now, I asked him, why did you not do a further study after you published in 2006? He said, unfortunately, the time was just not right. It was still, and we still are in the middle of the drug wars and stuff, but it was really the stigma was still massive and all that. And that has shifted in the past 10 years. And he's now doing a new study at the University of Arizona to try and you know, get more information about what, what he's doing. So we did this um, call for proposals three years ago. Professor Nutt uh, came first, and then we did a crowdfunding campaign. And this is the study evaluating the effects on the five HT2A agonists, psilocybin on the neurocognitive and clinical coronates of compulsivity. So it is a pharmacological challenge feasibility study. So we're trying to detect a signal.
OK, uh, this is Professor Nutt. You've probably all heard of him. He's a real leading light in this. Uh, I really do admire him. You know, I mean, he's, you know, he, he's just like such a dynamo when it comes to his publishing papers and books and doing talks and all that kind of stuff. This is a little bit what, that we, what we did in our campaign. I won't go into the detail there. Um, but really what we seem to see with psilocybin is that it completely disrupts thinking patterns and negative thinking patterns. And anybody who's had OCD will know how much you get stuck in a very inflexible way of thinking. You just get stuck and you just can't seem to shift out of it, you know. And what we're hoping to see and what we seem to be seeing in the anecdotal reports is that it disrupts this thinking pattern and it works on what we believe is cognitive flexibility. And that's what we're trying to show here, okay. So what we're trying to figure out is can, OC, uh, can psilocybin reduce repetitive OCD thinking? Can it increase cognitive inflexibility? And it can, can it allow a better response to behavior therapy? Okay, so this is the experimental design. Um, what we're going for here is what's called um, a, a not quite psychedelic dose. It's 10 milligrams. So that is between, if you look at the Merino study, 10 milligrams is kind of between the low dose and the medium dose. So patients will feel something, but they won't have the full-blown psychedelic experience. Now, why did we do that? Um, Professor Feinberg spoke to her patients. So she runs uh, NHS clinic in Welling Garden City for people with very severe OCD. And from speaking to her patients and all that, they were like, they are worried about anything that could really disrupt their minds. And they're worried about the full blown psychedelic experience. And so, what we don't know is does psilocybin work differently in depressed patients, for instance, for whom the full psychedelic experience seems really important, and OCD patients. And one of the worries we have is OCD patients, you just get stuck on thoughts. And in your full blown psychedelic, experience, is there a risk that an OCD patient might get stuck on some random thought which is just not important and come out of that with a new obsession or whatever, you know. And so we're trying to be cautious with this, you know. So that's why we're going for the 10 milligram dose. And what we're trying to see, and there'll also be a one milligram dose which will be like a placebo. So patients will get um, two of these doses, one, one of each dose with a four week uh, break in between, okay. And there'll be a whole bunch of cognitive tests to do with cognitive flexibility and also the Y box. Now the Y box is the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Score, which is the gold standard for OCD uh, trials. Uh, you can you score basically, there's questions on your obsessions, you know, how much do you obsess every day and all that kind of stuff and questions on your compulsions and that comes to a score out of 40. You know, in very severe cases, like I know one of our volunteers uh, scored 39 out of 40. Uh, in the end, she found deep brain stimulation helped her get better. But generally, if you're scoring over 20, you're starting to get into the severe range. And anybody with a score over 16 um, will be potentially included in the study. So 20 participants. Overall, it's going to take 18 months uh, because you have to take time to actually recruit people and dose them. And it started six months ago. You know, it actually took us two years to set it up. One of the reasons was COVID. Um, one of the other reasons was just it's so difficult to get all the home office regulations and licenses. You know, I mean, we're still very much in the Stone Age, unfortunately, when it comes to that vis-a-vis -vis the government. But it all worked out in the end, and so it started six months ago. Okay, so um, a little bit more. How do we actually think that it works in OCD? So we know that it works under 5-HT uh, neuro um, kind of receptors. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist by background. I did a PhD in social psychology 20 years ago, but I'm not a biologist or anything. But from what Professor Nutt says, what he's interested in is particularly on the 5-HT2A receptor, okay? And there's also some question over whether psilocybin actually potentially has an effect on glutamate. And glutamate is the kind of new frontier in OCD research. We know that ketamine works on glutamate, and ketamine seems to have an effect also on OCD, you know? So these are all kind of things uh, that we're interested in. So uh, a little bit more, the kind of ratings things that we'll be doing, okay? So as I said, uh, we'll be looking at the Y box. Uh, we'll also be doing EGs, okay, to get better understanding there on the brain. We'll be doing blood test, a plasma, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is apparently increased by psilocybin and is decreased in OCD and has to do with neurogenesis and those kinds of things, you know. And also looking at what they call extra-dimensional shift, which is a measure of cognitive flexibility. So what we're really trying to see is do patients have a more flexible way of thinking? And if they do, does that mean we could then use psilocybin with cognitive behavioral therapy or other forms of therapy to kind of help them engage with that? Because one of the problems that I see in my support group and from speaking to OCD patients 
is patients actually really struggle just to engage with therapy. You know, they struggle with exposure response prevention because it creates so much anxiety and those kinds of issues. So can this actually help, you know? So that's the, the, the approach that we're taking there. Now, a little bit about the other studies. The two other studies that are really um, interesting are the Marino study that I've talked about, but also the Yale study. So Benjamin Kelmandy is uh, the person at Yale who is running that. And I spoke to him a few years ago and I asked him, why are you doing this study in psilocybin? And uh, he said he'd been studying OCD for years and he'd found it such a difficult illness to tackle. And then he was contacted by a patient who he'd really struggled actually to, to help get better. And the patient said, my OCD has gone. And he was like, well, how did that happen? He said, I've been treating myself with magic mushrooms. And he was like, what? You know, this doesn't make any sense. And he looked into it. And like a lot of psychiatrists, when they start to look at psychedelics, originally at the beginning, they're kind of all, you know, kind of uh, skeptical and all that. And they look into it and they think, actually, there really might be something there. And that's why he decided to, um, to, to do this uh, particular study. So we've now got um, the study at um, Arizona, a study at Yale. Uh, there's a study in Israel and a study in... Um, at Imperial College, and I think there might be other studies going, but he's basically looking at a single dose. And what's really interesting is when you read the paper that he wrote, that he published last December, where he takes the case study of an individual, I think they call him Daniel or whatever in there. So this is a 33-year-old uh, who had intractable OCD for decades, and it had very much ruined his life. It made life just so difficult for him and all that. And um, so um, he had actually tried LSD and had done nothing to to his, um, to his OCD. He then tried mushrooms and it helped a bit and all that. And then he decided to enroll in this study because he thought, well, you know, I'll give it a go, you know, in a, in a clinical study to actually see what happens. And what was really interesting is that the preparation was really, really important before he actually took the dose. And he took quite a high dose. So they do it on a kilogram weight and he ends up taking a dose of, I think, 19 and a half uh, milligrams, which is twice the dose that we've used here, which is a psychedelic dose. And um, what's really interesting is that in the preparation for him, they don't actually really discuss much as OCD symptoms. You know, a lot of the preparation is about uh, your emotions, uh, managing your emotions, learning to let go, and learning to let go during the psychedelic experience. And then he describes the psychedelic history. It's really worth reading this. It's actually, it's in a paper, uh, 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 um, um, a journal called Hellion, which is written H-E-L-I Y-O-N, which was published in December 2022. And um, it's, it makes such a fascinating read because then he has the experience, you know, in a clinical setting with these two uh, facilitators who he's got to know quite well, which I think is very important. And throughout his whole psychedelic experience, he has the whole ego death and then he's reborn uh, as a tree and all that. And what he, um, the preparation had taught him so much about letting go of his emotions and all that, that it's, he learns all about the acceptance. And the fascinating thing he says is that he had come across these concepts before, you know, in like acceptance, commitment therapy and all that. And I know that from experience, you understand them mentally, okay, but it's when you really believe them emotionally and physically that it seems to make the difference. And that's the breakthrough that he has. And then after that, he says it's the most powerful experience he's ever had. Uh, within 48 hours, his Y box had gone down from I think 24 to like two and all that. Three months later, it's like zero. 18 months later, it's zero and all that. Now, what uh, Dr. Kalmandi says is that this is not typical of the patients who have been on the study. You know, uh, some of them don't react, some of them react partially and all that. But it does show the promise of what actually it can do. And I think it also shows about the, 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 the importance of the preparation, but also the integration that happens afterwards, you know. And it's interesting because when you, um, there's a podcast uh, from the International OCD Foundation where they interview uh, Dr. Marino and all that kind of stuff about, you know, how he conducts a study. And it's quite similar to this. And um, it's on YouTube. It's really worth listening to. And um, he explains that actually during the psychedelic experience, um, they don't provide any kind of psychological, you know, they don't tell the person to face their OCD symptoms or anything like that. They just provide support in case the person gets anxious. But it really is all in the preparation and in the integration afterwards, you know. So basically, I, I just found that's really promising. 
And um, so we'll see what comes out of our study. You know, our study, it's good to actually have studies that are looking at different things. Some are looking at the full psychedelic dose. Ours is looking at kind of the sub-psychedelic dose and all that, because then we'll get a better understanding of what to do. So the question then is, well, what happens next? You know, anybody who's been in drug development knows how expensive it is to get a drug to regulatory standards. You have to go through phase two. You have to go through phase three. You have to go for EMA approval, FDA approval, you know, to do PKPD, all this and all that. So our hope is that if this works, we'll be able to do a much larger study, you know, and this might involve having to work with a pharma company or whatever, or actually doing it ourselves. We just don't know yet, but we're really committed to actually making it work. Um, so just two things before I finish. Uh, one is other psychedelics. So I've been, a, a year ago, I spoke to a company called Small Pharma. You might have heard of them. They're doing DMT for depression. I know the, the founder. And we've been discussing about whether DMT could help for OCD. And uh, from speaking to patients, they were like, well, that sounds like, like, that sounds like psilocybin, you know, like times 100, the DMT experience. So what we've actually done uh, in the past year is we've actually done a survey, uh, which has been ethics approved by University of Hertfordshire, to actually find out from patients, would they be interested in a, you know, joining studies with a very strong psychedelic experience? What would be the barriers to that and you know, all that kind of stuff? And we've also asked them about all kinds of other stuff like brain stimulation, everything, because we really want to know if we do actually do a DMT study, you know, what are the ethical considerations and all that to take into account before we design it with a patients. And the other thing, the big thing, is we launched our registry actually a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a UK registry, soon to be a global registry. So any of you who have OCD who are interested in joining in research, join our registry. And this will be mainly for academic and clinical studies, but it might also be for uh, pharma studies if ever there's a pharma company which is interested in OCD, which at the moment is quite rare. And that's it. So I think I've got three minutes left. I just wonder if there are any questions.